If you have been at all paying attention to Christian books, uh, and it used to be these things called Christian bookstores. I know there's still a few around, but now with the advent of the interwebs and everything, it's not as popular. But uh, and so then you don't get like the display case of what's on the you know what's in the window. But if there was a display case in the window, there's been a significant rise of books that have the phrase gospel centered in the in the beginning of it. These literally have the gospel-centered kids' ministry, gospel-centered teaching, gospel-centered mom, good idea, uh, gospel-centered discipleship, gospel-centered hermeneutics, uh, Herman who? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, means how you interpret the Bible, and, and gospel-centered life at work, and there's all, all, this phrase is just really, really thick. We, we use it as well. I mean, it's a, but I'd say it's probably only about a 10-year or so phrase that has been buzzing around. In fact, Tim Chalice this guy blogs, man. This guy blogs a ton, and, and I re really enjoy some of the things that he has to write about. I, I kind of don't read a lot of blogs because they make me angry most of the time, but, but every now and then I go over to Tim, and let me, let me read what he says here. And this is in 2013, so this is five years ago. He says, gospel-centeredness is all the rage today. We are told to live gospel-centered lives, to pray toward a gospel-centered faith, to have gospel-centered humility, to be gospel-centered parents, to form gospel-centered churches, to have gospel-centered marriages, to say goodbye at gospel-centered funerals. The gospel, we are told, must be central to all we are and all we do. This is good. God really does mean for the gospel to be central to the lives of his people and to be right at the center of the church. Uh, there are really only two options for local churches. They will be gospel-centered, or they're going to be issue-driven. And I, I agree with him. He goes on in the article, and I won't go through the whole blog post here, but he says, but I have some concerns about this as well. One of which is, when you start using a phrase and it becomes a buzz phrase, it loses its meaning. It, it just, it just kind of does. And so he made a list. This is all, there you, there's no way you can read that, but those are just a casual research in 2013 of all the books that either have this title, gospel-centered, or really, they don't have it in the title, but they're, they're, it's, it's a book that's very, like, it'd be about that topic. It's all that thick. And so, um, this, what happens then is, when you start using a word, and you keep using that word over and over and over, or phrase in this case, pretty soon, to create, to quote the great theologian, The Princess Bride, you keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means, right? In fact, I have a friend who's a little bit older than me, he's a pastor, and he came to me and said, listen, all you younger guys, I guess I'm a younger guy, all you keep using this phrase, gospel-centered, gospel-centered, and I keep asking him, what does that mean? What do you mean by that phrase? And they say, well, it takes a long time to explain, and they try to explain it, and it takes a long time. And he said, I, I just keep pressing on people. Just give me a simple explanation. Now, if there's anything I do well, it's take something complicated, which I don't understand, and make it simple to make it sound like I understand. I do that very well. In fact, I, when I was at Bethlehem Baptist Church right down the street and John Piper was there, and then we started Hope Community Church, I told John, I said, I'm making a living taking what you say and bringing it down so people can understand it, all right? <laughs> And John Piper laughed. Yes, he did. <laughs> so I got that going for me. So I looked at my buddy and I said, I can do it in four words. Gospel centrality is four words. And the four words are, I'm okay in Jesus. I'm okay in Jesus. Uh, th this goes back for me uh, to a time uh, I became a follower of Jesus Christ during my freshman year, and that might be where some of you are at right here in this room, either in your freshman year, parte, right? Okay, so that might be where you're at. And did I just make myself old or what? Uh, yeah, it's like, wow. Uh, but you might be there, or you might be just here just checking things out. That's where I was. I, and, and, and no offense, but you all seemed a little weird to me. All right, so now I'm weird to me, if that makes sense. But I just needed to put my toes in the water and to see what this thing was all about. And somewhere in the spring of my freshman year, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. 
about three years later, three, three and a half years later or so, uh, in the fall of my fifth year senior, I did a victory lap around the, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I heard a message, and it was by a pastor from a church here in the Twin Cities, Church of the Open Door, and I heard this message, and uh, it, it, some wheels started spinning for me, just how free we are in the gospel and how, how it really is, I'm, I'm absolutely okay. As a follower of Jesus, I, I don't have to measure up to anything. I, I'm okay. I'm, I'm 100% okay right now. It is not about my performance. It's not about how good I do. It's not about pleasing anyone. I'm just okay in Jesus. And that phrase started becoming for me way back then a buzz phrase in my life. And I've been waiting all these years to do a four-week series on this, and you're getting it. Four weeks now. And what we're going to do in this series is every week we're going to preach, I'm okay in Jesus, but we're going to focus on one word. <laughs> okay? So this week it's, I'm okay in Jesus. All right? This whole thing, though, this, this, uh, these four words do crescendo. I'm okay in Jesus. And this is a Christian church, obviously. And so we're talking about Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished. And it is because of his accomplishments that the whole thing works backwards. So you have to talk about all four words every week. But this week, we're going to get into the word I'm. Philosophers will say that basic humanity, now this is not necessarily from a Christian worldview, but just any worldview, basic humanity comes up with three questions that you start pondering even at an early age. And they just start resonating with you. And the three questions of some format are, who am I? Where did I come from, and where am I going? Basic philosophical questions. Who am I? What, what, where did I come from? Where am I going? Who am I? What does that lean into? Who am I leans into? What does it actually mean that I'm human? And how am I different from other parts of the world, animals, or even just objects? Is there a difference between me and them? And, and, and then as I look at humanity, especially if you turn on the news, is humanity good or is humanity evil, right? Which is it? Where did I come from? Leans into this. Is there really any purpose behind my life? Is there any meaning to that? And what, Why was I put here on planet Earth? And then lastly, where am I going? Is there any plan? For the future of us, is there any design for my life in particular? Is, and is there, uh, how can I find out what this plan is? Those are the questions that people ask and they wrestle with deeply. And there are different views on how to answer that, right? Views on humanity. Okay, so this would be called anthropology, right? And I know there's, if you're, if you're studying anthropology, what I'm about to do, even the rest of this whole thing is, is you're going, whoa, that was just a little, little tiny thing on how deep, uh, how deep anthropology can go. Admittedly, that is totally true. You are exactly right. It is a complicated field. Love that field. Uh, and there's a lot to talk about. We're gonna give just, just like a few sentences here, okay? Just basic views. A naturalism or naturalistic view of humanity would say, has to answer the question, where do we come from? And they would say, all that is seen is all that is real. Okay, that's it. That's all we know. This might be called like a, 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 an overly uh, simplistic scientific method, right? All you can see is all you can know, and therefore materialism, and what I mean by that is the material world, all you can see and touch is all that there really is. That's all we really know. Where do we come from? It has to be from time plus chance, and we got here. That, okay, that's way different than, than uh, uh, when, when people will talk about how do we get here, and even looking at the Bible and saying, perhaps God used evolution. Or that. that's, not, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about merely time plus chance, and we just, just got here. That's what happened. We got really lucky, and we're, we're here. Naturalism then leans on that we're really just made of chemicals, uh, we're just, uh, 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 in, over a period of time, we became, you know, hum humans at the time, uh, survival of the fittest, and we got, that's who we are, and therefore, there really is no real purpose. There is no, there is no like, plan. We're just, 
just trying to make, make do, there is no real meaning and there is no spiritual aspect to us. Okay? So that would be what, what that'd just be an overly simplistic way of what would be a naturalistic way of looking at it. An Eastern way, or what some would call uh, New Age. Now I'm dumping all kinds of different things, Eastern religions together, and they're, they're all, it's, it's, everything's got its own little nuances, but basically it says something like this, that what we are is we're just part of nature, and we want to get one with nature, and we want enlightenment. What we really need is to be enlightened, to be set free. In, in different religions, it looks differently. It looks uh, to, to reach the Buddha is, you know, in Buddhism or different like that. God is all and all is God. And again, that might be overstating it for some of the religions, but that's the concept in that I'm not really any, I need to just become one with nature. In fact, in Hinduism, you can come back as a different animal, whether how, how good or bad you have lived. And of course, there's, there's obviously truth to, to, to everything that we're talking about here. We live in a material world, and we also, there's, there's some truth to God's footprint on the world. Just if you are outside in nature, there's a sense of feeling like uh, it's there. So there, there's, we don't, we, don't, we don't say no to all this, but there's some things that, as we look at from a biblical mindset, that would be different. Islam uh, would not be put into an Eastern religion way. They, they reject that completely. And, and there would be other religions that are not as well known. This would be the third predominant way, according to a uh, professor. He likes to call himself Charlie. I've never met a professor named Charlie, but his name is Charlie Self. He's associate professor at uh, Assemblies of God Seminary. He says the third way is the, the uh, like uh, thinking of a hierarchical way. And he looks at, at Islam as the best and simplest example. That's the only reason he uses them. And he says, first are uh, Muslim males, then Muslim females. Big divide there. Then followed by misguided Christians and Jews. And then next hierarchy of just the fact of how human you are would be pagans and atheists. All right, that's the way it would get be like a hierarchical view. There are, there are multiple categories of how they are. And, and, and other religions and, and different societies will look at people whether or not they're of value based on those things. What we're trying to do this morning is get toward, I'm just gonna say toward, because uh, uh, I know, I know uh, we're, we're gonna try to go with this as in depth as we can, but even so, we're just gonna kind of start toarding. What does the Bible teach about that? What does the Bible teach about who I am, where did I come from, where am I going? All right, that's where we're headed today. So, if you got a Bible with you, we're gonna go left to right as good as possible. We're gonna start in Genesis 1. If, if, uh, if, it, you, you, if you just wanna look at that insert, that's fine, or just pay attention on the screen. There is an insert you can get from hopecc.com. It'll come up in all the message notes if you wanna know kind of where I'm going. There is a little bit of a pattern where I'm headed back and forth here. So, uh, it is amazing how much you can get from the first three or four chapters of the book of the Bible. It is amazing how much, especially if you start with, and I just did this with a group of our interns, I said, pretend you know nothing, and let's just look at Genesis 1 and ask the question, who is God? It is amazing what you can learn just about who God is in those few words in just Genesis chapter 1. In the first verse of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, it doesn't say how, it doesn't say exactly when, it just says in the beginning. The important thing to get out of Genesis 1 is not some big debate about how old the earth is or exactly how we did it. The point is, who did it and the means. So, if you look in Genesis 1, it says God creates, and how does he create? He just speaks, and stuff happens. He speaks and the earth is created. He speaks, and the heavens are there. He speaks, and there's light. And if you keep going through Genesis 1, he looks at stuff that he makes at the end of the day, and it matters how you interpret the word day, but just end of that day, whatever it is, uh, he says it is good. So God not only creates, but he's also the one that defines good and not good even then trending towards what would be bad or evil, okay? Really important. That's God. Now, if we just a second time, go down to verse 26, chapter one. The first book of the Bible says, then God said, 
Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now, what does that mean? Lot. It means a lot. But the simplest way of putting it is kings would have images made of them in that period of time, and the image was to honor them as the deity or the important one, if it wasn't a deity, but most times in the, at the time that this was written, other kings would make images of themselves to be worshiped as deity because they were deity, all right? And God, we just went through the book of Exodus, says, I don't want you to make any images of me except the one I made. He says, let's make mankind in our image. In other words, let's have that be the reflection the likeness of, of the Trinity, of God. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that, so that, that word, that phrase means the result of it or the purpose behind it is, they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So that's important there. So what's happening? God creates little kings to rule, and what they're supposed to do is rule over the earth, right? The animals, the birds, the, the livestock, wild animals, and we're gonna see if you were to look in chapter two, he's gonna put them in a garden so that they can work the garden, so they're working over the earth. They are the ones now in control of this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, and the author of Genesis, which you tend to lean on it was Moses, it says that male and female, he created them. He wants to make it real clear here that maleness and femaleness is an important part of God's design and that there is no hierarchy between them. They are, they are made in the image of God. That's Genesis chapter one, and this is huge. We're made in the image of God. We're made in his likeness, There's, but we're not God. We're, we're separate. We're not God, but we're made in his image, and we are we are to rule over things. We are to steward things that he has given to us. So we're a king with a small K, and he's a king with a capital K. And there's some sense which we are like him. We are relational like him. We are spiritual like him. We are emotional like him. We are intellectual like him. We have volition. We have choices like him, okay? But not exactly like him, but like him, okay? So... But it's different. We are different than the animals. I love my beagle. I can't lie in church. I like my beagle. <laughs> I tolerate my beagle, okay? Uh, I, 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 I love her, but some days, holy cow, beagle, wow. Bark, 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 bark. Anyway, um, but she's not made in the image of God. She's got some interesting things, but she's not made in the image of God. Something about humanity puts it at a different whole level, according to the Bible. Okay, so the biblical anthropology says something very special about humanity. We're not just part of nature. We are the pinnacle of creation. We are the pinnacle of all this happening, and this is what God is doing. In fact, in another place in the Bible, God even says it this way. Uh, in Gen Isaiah 47, <clears throat> I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Okay, so, so he's, he's saying here is that what, why God went out of his way to create was not because he was lonely. Ah, like, oh, man, it's just nothing to do today. Maybe I'll create some people, right? Nope, he was having a great time in the Trinity. They were hanging out. They were having a great time in eternity past. It was no problem. But they create this to display the, the glory of God is his display of all that, he is, all that he is, his essence. It's like a light bulb. Whoa, I just looked up at that bulb. But it's the, 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 the bulb is the Bernie thingy. Uh, sorry if I got technical there. But, and then the, the glory is the actual light. Okay, so the, now maybe it isn't Bernie thingies anymore. Maybe it's something else that does it. Whatever's happening, it, whatever's happening there, but then the light is the glory. But, it's, but the, the, the image of who God is, it's the, it's the reflection or it's the, the eminence of his awesomeness, okay? He says he creates us for that glory. How cool is that? Not only that, but he says you're created. Oh, oh, God, sorry, I gotta hit a couple quotes here. 
the, the fact that we are created for God's glory guarantees that our lives are significant. When we first realize that God did not need to create us and does not need us for anything, we could conclude that our lives have no importance at all. But scripture tells us that we are created to glorify God, indicating that we are important to God himself. This is the final definition of genuine importance or significance to our lives. If we are truly important to God for all eternity, then what greater measure of importance or significance could we want? Ooh, that's huge, right? In fact, it's so huge, it's said simply in the 1600s, after the Reformation happens and there's all these different groups, there was a group that came along and tried to unite them which is ironic because they were Scottish, Scottish, and they're trying to unite people instead of dividing, which is, again, maybe a little story, history uh, irony there. But anyway, the, the, what they said in this little thing they put together called the Westminster Confession, they said this, whoopsie, whoopsie. They said this, they said, what is the chief end of man, man meaning mankind, mankind's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Wow. So we're not only just created to glorify God, we are actually created for incredible joy. Psalm 1611 says it clear. You have made known, the psalmist is writing and he says this to God. He says, you've made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. You and I were created for God's glory in his image, in his likeness, to steward the earth, to have all these characteristics, but you're made also to be joyful. It's just something that's gonna come alive. That's the way we're created. And it doesn't last very long. It lasts two chapters of the Bible. If, if I were God, there would be Four chapters to the Bible. One and two, how I created everybody. Chapter three, how you disobeyed. And chapter four would be this amazing special effects and everything of how I just whacked you all, just got rid of everybody. <laughs> That's not the Bible. It's, that, there's any, that there's chapters after Genesis three, if you don't believe in a God of mercy and grace, you're not reading the same Bible. But we have to stop and see here what happened. So we wanna walk through Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from, the tree, from any tree in the garden? That's not what God said. Uh, the woman's gonna do it a little more accurately. She says, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. So we have freedom here. God has given us free will. We can read from any tree in the garden, but he's restricted us from the tree you must not eat, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die, okay? And so uh, a lot of people make a big deal about, it seems like Eve is adding some things here, that placing it in the middle of the garden, and that she's not supposed to touch it, because what God said to Adam in chapter two was, don't just eat it. That's all he said, but... Maybe that's the way Adam told Eve. We don't know uh, this. So now the serpent just flat out lies to him. Says, you will not surely die. Liar. Then the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. True statement. And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. True statement. But you're gonna die. False statement. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave, to her, gave some to her husband who was with her. Don't, don't rat out Eve here. Adam was there watching, watching the, the BYU beat Wisconsin yesterday. Anyway, uh, something. <laughs> Uh, or the Gophers, huh? Huh? Or the Tommies, huh? Huh? Yeah. One guy, Johnny. Anybody else want to shout out their college team? Okay, so he, he, he's not paying attention. He's not helping. He also eats, okay? He also eats. They chose to disobey God, and they do it because it looks good 
It's pleasing to the eye. It looks like it'd be fun food to eat. And it's desirable for gaining wisdom. What, what's going on here? Remember, God is the one who calls things good and not good, good and evil. And, and now Eve says, I, 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 I don't, I don't want to be a king with a small K. And Adam says this too. I, I want to be a king with a, I want to be a king with a capital K. I want to call things good and evil. Then both of their eyes were opened and they realized they were naked. They didn't realize they were naked before, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings from themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. By the way, that is the saddest verse in all the entire Bible. Because they heard this sound and they knew exactly what it was. That's the sound God makes at the cool of the day, at the end of the day, when the sun is just going down and we walk together and we have nest tea time and we hang out. That's what relationship got with God, what it was like, and it's no longer gonna be like that anymore. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? God knows where he is, okay? He calls out, where are you? He says, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. God follows it up. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I command you not to eat from? It's a yes or no question, right? He instantly goes to the woman. First words here are the woman. Third word, more condemning, you put here with me. Who does Adam ultimately blame? God. My mentor has pounded this into my head. When you can't handle the shame, you always move to blame. And Adam just does it. Remember that woman that you gave me, God? She was defective. She did it. In fact, God, you're the one who did it. She gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then God asks the woman, what is it you've done? And she says, the serpent. Now, at least Eve has the common courtesy to answer the question. What is it you've done? She answers it. God asks, have you eaten from the tree? It's a yes or no question, right? Adam answers, the woman. The woman is not yes or no. The woman is a different answer. <laughs> Didn't ask that. The serpent deceived me and I ate. And then God goes and says, here's the deal. And theologians disagree whether or not this is this is what's coming now is what's called the curse, okay? And, and the, the, the we live in a different kind of world now. And, and theologians have said, well, is this a result of Adam and Eve's sin? And God is just saying, well, since you brought this in, this is what life's gonna be like. I'm just gonna tell you. Or is this God pronouncing you've done this and so now this is your punishment? Or is it some kind of a mixture of the both? And I don't know, I kind of lean towards the third option there. Because you've done this, curse thee, speaking to the serpent, now cursed above are you above all the livestock and the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity, I'll put war between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Genesis 3.15 is what the world's gonna now be like. There's gonna be this spiritual war going on between people and the forces of evil. Evil's gonna try to influence constantly and, and, and this offspring of the woman, uh, humankind, right, is going to have this tension always. And it's also what theologians would call the proto eulangarian which is meaning it's the first proclamation of the gospel. It's saying that one day, Something's gonna happen. This offspring weighed on the line, he's gonna crush your head, but you're gonna strike his heel. You're gonna kill him though, I mean, not eternally, but he's gonna, he's gonna crush you and end you. That's what life's gonna be like. To the woman, he says, I'll greatly increase your pains in childbearing with the pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So this relationship that was perfect in Genesis chapter two is now gonna be messed up. It says your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And I'll get back to that word desire in just a moment. I'll show you what's ha gonna happen as sin plays its course out here, all right? But it's not good. And then he says to Adam, he says, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. There's something wrong with the world because of, uh, because of you. Through, through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Because, you, because Adam and Eve, because you did sin here, guess what? Now death comes. And they're like, what is death? They don't even know what death is. 
this is what life's gonna be like now. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. It's, it's a sign of God's grace even right there. He just doesn't completely leave them. And the Lord God said, the man now has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, right? Yeah, that's true. Not like a God, but now he has this, he's wanted to be, elevate himself to be God and has sinned as a result. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and, also, and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. That's a very graceful thing that God does not leave us in this state forever. And then he goes on and says, so the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after you drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, why is that? Because they wanted to go back in. And I'd argue every single day of my life, I wake up in the morning and want to go back in. And so do you. Because we're created for something that we don't live in. We're created in this imageness and this for glory and for incredible joy. And we live in a world that's not quite like that. There's a movie put out. It's an early 90s movie, but it was a movie called Grand Canyon. And I, I, when I saw this movie, I went, oh my gosh, this, nobody says it better. Danny Glover plays this tow truck driver who's just trying to do his job. And in the middle of trying to do this job, uh, Steve Martin's character is getting held up with a guy with a gun. And, and uh, the, 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 uh, Danny Glover just says to the guy, hey man, just, just let me get this guy's car. He's, he's, I need to get this out. Just stop. Just don't do this. And the guy says to him, are you, are you saying that to me out of respect, or are you saying that because I got a gun? And Danny Glover says this line, which is perfect. He says, man, the world ain't supposed to be like this. Maybe you don't know that. Maybe this ain't the way it's supposed to be. But this ain't the way it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to be able to do my job without asking you if I can. And that dude is supposed to be able to wait with his car without you ripping him off. Everything's supposed to be different than what it is. I think it's one of the greatest proofs of Christianity is that you and I both know without a shadow of a doubt, this is not right. We live in a world we're not made for. And it's just something wrong. Every funeral I go to, every funeral I go to, uh, I, 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 it's not right. People are not meant to die. And, and, I, and I, I, you know, I, I have a trigger warning on this, so if you're gonna do a funeral and you mention to me or to the crowd and you say, well, death is a natural part of life, I'm gonna punch you in the throat. Because <laughs> I'll wait till after the service, but it's not <laughs> part of life. We're not meant to die. And we do. It's not right. We're not meant to world, live in a world with temptation. Right? It's not. <laughs> so how does this play itself off? We move to Genesis chapter four. It's crazy here. So uh, Adam, Adam made love to his wife, Eve. Actually, the, 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 the phrase there is Adam knew his wife is what it says, if you know what I'm saying. So they change it now. But anyway, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I've brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. So it's interesting, observation here. We, God has not completely given up on his people even though they're in this fallen condition, all right? And, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So he, he liked what Abel was doing better than what Cain was doing. Text doesn't tell us exactly why. People make a lot of speculations. Not important for our conversation, okay? So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? And he knows what Cain is thinking about doing. If you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. <laughs> right? It's this hidden tiger sin crouching thing, right? And it's just crouching. 
and it desires to have you. That's the same word that says you, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. It says, right? But you must rule over it. So we live in a world now where sin is crouching at my door and desires to just take me out. But I also live in a world where I still have volition. I still have choices. But you must rule over it, God says. That makes no sense if I don't have volition. I do have volition. Now I'm bent, just like Cain, to not follow God. But I have volition. I'm responsible. God hasn't taken away our, our, our volition, our, our, our choices, our will. Okay? So it's still there. And God has not completely given up on us. In fact, when you go further in the account, after Noah and the flood, sounds like a punk band here, but, and, and, and God says this, he says, and from each human being too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. And the whole point of this is not, not to get into a, uh, whether or not capital punishment should still be around. I'm not making that argument here, but he says, for in the image of God, has God made mankind? And this is after the fall. This is really, really, really important. The image of God, is that lost in humanity after sin? And the answer here, clearly from Genesis 9, 6 is no. There are huge implications because of that. Let me let Wayne Grudem do it. I think he does it well. He says, yet we must remember that even fallen, sinful mankind has the status of being in God's image. Every single human being, no matter how much the image of God is marred by sin or illness or weakness or age or any other disability or how they vote, oh, sorry, wasn't that not in there? Anyway, still has the status of being in God's image and therefore must be treated with dignity and respect that is due to God's image bearer. Every person, you've never met a human being who's not an image bearer. This has profound implications for our conduct towards others. It means that pe people of every race and fill in every other thing deserve equal dignity, rights, right? There, it, there is dignity in, in humanity because God has made them that way even over things that we would totally disagree over. They still have that dignity because they're made in the image of God. The image of God is marred by sin, but it is not lost. Very important. Very important. Now, we're, we're created, I already quoted these passages, right? We're created for God's glory and for incredible joy. That's what we're created for. And yet the, the fall, the, the sin comes into the world, we don't live there. That's not how I live. How do you get that back? How do you get that back? How's that restored? Well, I'm okay in Jesus. I'm okay in Jesus. And it's because of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter three. The righteous, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Not about being a good person, not being better than everyone, not about voting the correct way, not about church attendance, not about giving a certain amount of money, not about anything like that. And those are, those are not bad things necessarily. But what it says here is, do I, just, do I trust in Jesus Christ alone? Am I going to undo what Adam and Eve did and say, I bend my knee to you as king? This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ the perfect human and fully God goes to the cross, pays the penalty for our sin so that we can actually be reconciled to God and become what fully human was intended to be. And he even goes further and says in, and later in that same book of the Bible, Romans chapter five, therefore since we have been justified through faith, our sins have been taken care of once you trust in Jesus Christ alone. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and listen to this, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We had fallen short and now we rejoice in it because of what Jesus Christ has done. 
We are back on that. Not only that, but what about our joy? Jesus says, as he's teaching, John chapter 10, he says, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Christ is not a killjoy. He wants to give you joy. That's the point. Sin is just a liar. This is joy. Sucka. Right? It's not joy. Christ says, I come in, I got the real deal. I came here for joy. So therefore, how do we look at ourselves and others? Oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. One day, now, here's the deal. I'm gonna quote a passage here in just a minute. You'll see it clearly. But right now, if you're a follower of Christ, you are a new person, it says, and you're on this trajectory of joy and glory, but you're not there yet. And this talks about 1 Corinthians 15 says, as with the earthly man, that's Adam, so are those who are of the earth, as is the heavenly man, that's Jesus, so also those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, we still have a fallenness to us, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. One day we will be like Christ completely. It'll all be restored. It'll all be the way it's supposed to be. The sword is coming down. We're going back to the Garden of Eden. That's what it's going to be. That's the purpose. That's the point. That's the meaning that we have is to glorify and enjoy God forever. So how do you look at others? How do you look at yourselves? Closing here. Paul says this. He says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. What's a worldly point of view? You don't matter I'm more important than you. I'm better than you. You can't, if you're, if you're a follower of Christ, you cannot possibly say I'm better than anybody else. You're just forgiven. You're not any better. In fact, I know most of you. Trust me, you're not. Okay? Some of you with green jerseys, especially. So, I know, I know. It gets a little thick. No, it doesn't. So, I did a wedding in Green Bay. I got a lot of crap, so it's just payback time. So, so from now on, regarding no one that way, though we once regarded Christ this way, we don't do that any longer. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. This is Paul's message everywhere he went. Remember, Paul himself doesn't become a follower of Jesus until this remarkable thing that happens to him. He persecuted Christians. He killed Christians. Thought they were the scum of the earth. Now his message is, be reconciled to God. Everywhere he goes. You can have true reconciliation with God. How? Through Jesus Christ. And here he says how? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I'm gonna read that one again. God made him who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. A couple of questions as we close. Number one, are you okay in Jesus? Is your okayness of all that you are made all these beautiful ways that God made you fallen? Are you restored because of Jesus? And if not, why not? And it's a question I had to wrestle with for months during my freshman year at the University of Minnesota. And if that's where you're at, I never want to push anybody into that. At the same time, I want to challenge your thinking and say, why not? And then secondly, if that is the case, then, then how will that play out in your week ahead? What, as you look at just even this next seven days specifically, how will it look in your classes, in your roommates, in your homes, dealing with your kids who are made in the image of God, loving on Packer fans who are made in the image of God? How will it make a difference in your, in your workplaces with that hard boss who's made in the image of God or someone who's fallen into sin? 
or someone who's disappointed you. What is it? How will this play out in your week ahead? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I praise you that we are okay in you. And it is because of you that we can, that we can say that. Lord, I ask that you would even in this room, even as I'm speaking, God, you'd be setting people free. Maybe for the very first time, they put their trust in Jesus Christ. And for the others of us, of us uh, we have done that, but we keep slipping and making our okayness about everything else. Lord, would it simply be in what you've done that you are the one who's done it all for us. So do that in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.